All right, there we go. We're all we're we're live, Mark. We're all we're good. So, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Scott McLaren. I am pinch hitting for Frankie Billingsley tonight in our umpire uh, webinar series. Um, very happy to be joined with Mark Quinn here. Who we're gonna and we're gonna go ahead and do just quickly before we get going. We want to make sure that uh, we acknowledge the land that we work and live and play on is the unceded territory of the silks. I'm getting better at that. I'm not great at it. Um, and the Wabanaki peoples, that's uh, where Mark and I are both. I'm out in the Okanagan in BC, Mark's in PEI. All right, just there we are. There's your hosts. So me, Scott McLaren, I'm on the ODC. I'm a level five and WBSC umpire. I've been doing this since 1986. So if you know how old I am, I actually started quite young. Per Scott Searle, personal request, I have to note that I've never mowed down Mark Sorensen. Um, whereas on the other side, we have uh, Softball Canada coaching committee member, Mark Quinn, who is a master coach developer, a head coach of our U18 men's national team, and has mowed down Mark Sorensen from what I hear. <laughs> Scott Searle. Yes. Oops. Hit the wrong button. There we go. Uh, my bad, folks. We hit the wrong button. There we go. All right. A couple of programming notes before we get going. Uh, we were scheduled to have Don Farr with us tonight. Um, so we could also, in the part two of this, talk about our, um, our new rule book except Don has a real life job. He is a chief, chief warrant officer in our Air Force. Um, so he's a little busy right now, um, but he will be able to be back with us next week. So he'll be about a week late. Um, so we're gonna do an impromptu March 14th rules seminar. Um, and we're gonna, not seminar, but explanation and introduction to the new rule book. So we'll do that next week. Just admit some more people and Programming number two, I understand that for all the coaches involved, we can give you guys PD points for tonight. But in order to get your PD points, we need your first last and last name, as well as your NCCP number posted in the chat. So if you can just post that, then we will make sure that uh, Miss Noonan is able to give you all your magic points. I assume that's what they are. I think you get some kind of discount at some point when you get hit a number, right, Mark? Cool. All right. Shall we get going, Mark? Yep. Rock and roll. Cool. All right. So the reason we're doing this is at the 2021 AGM, it was voted to remove all restrictions on the pitching rule and adapt the WBSC rule for all categories of play. So this, this rule has been in place for the last couple of years for some categories, but not all of our categories. And whereas the only change this year is it's in the, the big rule or the, the main WBSC rule is in force for everybody. So there's no more restrictions. So that we're just going to give you a, Mark and I are going to give you a quick introduction to this pitching rule. Um, so you know what it is to pitch legally in our country. Um, we're not going to necessarily teach you how to pitch. We're just going to teach you the points that allow you to pitch legally. So, our three objectives, we're going to show you our very new Softball Canada pitching legal video, let you know a little bit of the intention of the video and how to use it. Um, then we're going to explore a few different aspects of the rule from a coach's and official's perspective. And then finally, where do we go now that we have this new rule in place? So those are the three things that you should get out of this tonight. And I believe we have about 25 minutes to do that because Mark has to go teach somebody else how to pitch right after. So here we go. Here's our video.
All right, Mark. So there's our video. And just for everybody to know that the video will be posted in the next day or two to the umpire's uh, YouTube page. Um, and we'll also share it with the Softball Canada YouTube page. So you'll have this there as a resource. Um, so the intent of the video is you're able to, you know, watch the video and have as a reference for any legal pitching motions. And, you know, when it gets to the slides or the portion where, you know, we're running text down the screen, just hit pause have a good read of it, and then move on to the next thing. So it's all there for you to have as a resource. It by no means covers every aspect of the rule, but it doesn't cover you know, most of what you need. And it doesn't teach you how to pitch though, but it does show let you know the things that you have to do in order, in order for it to be a legal pitch. So we're gonna run quickly through this. Mark and I are gonna add comments. Mark from the coaching perspective, me from the official's perspective, mostly for as an official what we're looking for, and, you know, and mark from the teaching and how to execute this on the mound. So the gist. Lost my cursor for a second there. So what it comes down to is players in all age categories, they can start with one foot on the rubber now. All categories now, when they push and drive from the rubber, they can have air between their push foot and the ground regardless of age. And what we're looking for as umpires is we're making sure that the arms are moving um, and moving forward prior to establishing, uh, you know, and pushing off from the ground again. So anything from you, Mark? Um, I think for myself, like, I mean, this, it's not a new rule. I mean, it's a rule that's now simply being applied with all of the age categories. So, um, you know, pitchers who have been using this rule from the U16 age, um, you know, from last year and previous years when they were throwing, we're really now looking at what, what this is going to look like for um, the introductory level pitcher. And does it really change a lot with how, um, you know, the beginning pitcher, and, and I'll use my daughter as an example, she's, she's going to play U11 this summer, she's nine years old. Um, and her and her teammates are learning how to pitch. Um, so, you know, for myself as a pitching instructor, um, you know, I think having one foot in the rubber, um, it allows um, young pitchers, to be honest, I think it allows them to be more comfortable. Um, you know, the pitchers that I've been working with this winter, introducing the one foot for those that haven't done it before, you know, now they walk onto the rubber, they've got one foot in the top, one foot behind. So there's a comfortable distance between the front foot, back foot. Um, the things that I was doing before as an instructor, um, encouraging them to, you know, use their legs to, to, to really drive away from the mound, um, that hasn't changed. Um, I think with the rule now, with the ability that if they do have some air, there's no penalty for it. Um, so for myself, I'm really hoping that it, it just encourages pitchers to, you know, use their legs to pitch. Um, I think some of the, the pitchers that I've been working with, if, if they've needed some adjustments with their delivery, you know, sometimes they're stepping off the mound. They're not using both their legs to really drive and explode, you know, away towards the catcher to throw the ball. You know, so now it's, you know, being able to encourage that to take place, I think is a good thing. Um, Will all pitchers leap, jump, hop? Um, I don't think so. I think at a younger age, I, I don't think they're ready for it. I think when they're ready, they'll, they'll start to do that. Um, you know, is there going to be a difference between the male game and the female game? You know, quite possibly. I mean, when we look at the women's Olympic program um, that just played this past summer, you know, there were some pitchers who had some air, some who didn't have any. And, you know, they're still elite level pitchers. Um, is it okay for like, I, I think of a young pitcher, a, a guy that I'm working with now and he's 14 and he's, you know, incur you know, he's using his legs to drive. Is he jumping and hopping and, and getting as much leap as say a Devin McCullough or a Patrick Burns or a Sean Cleary? No, he's not, you know, because he's not at that level yet. You know, will he get to that level? I think over time, um, if he's, you know, able to do that, I think he will. Um, I guess for me, it's, it's, you know, I like now as a coach or an instructor having one rule and one level playing field to work from. Um, and I go back to last summer, uh, the same young fellow that I had, he was going to a U14 Eastern Canadian. And, you know, is he, at that point, he had to have two feet in the rubber. He was push and drag. Um, 
in the summer, he played against some older level kids who could go to one foot. They were leaping. So there was a back and forth. Uh, what gets called? What doesn't get called? Uh, now it's that level playing field. So no matter what age level, it's the same rule. So I'm really hoping that if, from a coaching point of view, it kind of gives us one sort of playing field to work with. And, and as an instructor, you know, I'm still going to be working with my pitchers on the same things. I don't think that's going to change. Um, and with younger levels, as I said, you know, I'm going to teach them to where they are, you know, that the introductory can pitch level where they are and how they work through that, you know, the can pitch program and how they work through, you know, then, you know, introduction of pitches and those things. I think that progression is going to stay the same. Um, but now, as I said, it just allows one rule all the way through, which I think is really good. I think it's great for coaches. I think it's good for instructors. Um, I think our athletes will meet us where they are. And then that's where us as coaches and instructors, we need to, you know, help them develop through that process. Excellent. All right, moving on. There we go. Uh, next, pre-pitch. Just as before, you know, we still need to have that um, motion of, a, of taking the sign or appearing to take the sign while they're, you know, attached to the pitcher's rubber. You know, we want all the fit players in fair, fair, fair territory except the catcher. Um, ball can be either in that pitcher's hand or glove while signs are taken. You know, nothing's changed here. These are all still aspects, you know, of whether there was the, you know, the leaping and, and, and one foot restrictions prior. These are still all requirements we've had. Nothing's changed here. Um, you can start with both feet on or one feet on, et cetera. Um, after you take the sign, you know, with your hands separated or appearing to take the sign, at least the pitcher can step back further and draw the hands together simultaneously to begin the pause. Um, thing to remember there is, once the hands have come together and the pause has started, the back foot cannot go back any further. It, it is now anchored into the ground at that point. Um, that doesn't mean it can't move within its own footstep, but it doesn't. What it means is it can't get any farther away from the pitching rubber. We're looking for a pause of two to five seconds, um, and I think you're gonna. This is one area where this is a, a discretionary thing on, on part of the officials. I think everybody can count one, two in probably 10 different speeds. Um, so I think the rule of thumb when you're looking at pitchers is you're looking for a full and complete stop of motion before they get into, before they begin their pitch. You know, and I think a lot of people, if you get that full and complete stop, you can comfortably say one, one second, two, one seconds and, and go from there. So body fully stopped, but you can be moving your hand around in the glove. And like I said, once you've paused, no more stepping backwards. And then as we go, you can lean backwards, but all forward motion with the feet has to go forward. So as long as the back foot doesn't get any farther away from the pitching rubber, then that's what we're looking for. Into the delivery. Again, these are all standards that we've had for quite some time. You know, we're starting with it fully connected to the pitching rubber plate when it starts it can shift or move forward a little bit provided that you know had they not shifted or twisted their foot it's not any closer to home plate than where it had started and like we said it's not considered breaking contact if the twist of the foot during the delivery causes the heel to slide off the front of the plate as long as the front foot is not so far ahead to cause the heel to contact so as long as it stays within its footstep well, that's what we're happy with Thing to remember here on the delivery, we need both feet to start within the 24 inches of the pitching plate. So even if you have one foot back, they still have to be within the width of the rubber, the entire, so there, entire foot. So hands go forward. So after leap or pushing from the plate, the non-pivot foot must land within the chute. And the chute is 24 inches, the width of the rubber extended forward towards home plate, and we can see the shoot exemplified here. There's the rubber, there's what the shoot would look like. So it doesn't stop where the green stops, that's just an example for you. So we're looking for one foot or a portion of the foot to be within that boundary. Um, it's, it's really important to remember that in Softball Canada play, if you're at a softball Canada event, and that's you know any of our Canadian championships, or if you want to play or participate as a member of our national team, 
you must be able to pitch in accordance with this requirement. There are other associations and leagues, or maybe even local leagues, or other associations in other countries that do not have the same requirement. Um, so my advice is for pitchers, make sure you pitch for where you want to play, not where you are. Um, so if you're allowed to pitch in a league without any consideration for the shoot, but you want to be part of the national team program or have success at Canadian championships, um, it's imperative that you can put your feet down when you deliver within these 24 inches. A couple other reminders here. All age categories, age and gender may now leap, land and release the ball during the delivery of the pitch, provided they do not establish a second push point or an action also known as a crow hop. And what we're looking for as umpires is for the hands to be separated and the arm motion in prior to the pitcher reestablishing contact with the ground. And then once started, the arm rotation must be smooth and continuous. That doesn't mean necessarily the same speed, but it has to be smooth and continuous as it goes. And here we go. So here we have another full example. The arms are separated and moving as the pivot foot lands. The landing foot is just partially inside the 24 inch chute, which is legal. And then the pivot foot here does not need to stay or land within the 24 inch chute during the delivery. So it's only the landing foot. That's not the back foot that's coming through, um, <laughs> the push foot there. <clears throat> so as we look at this, I'll ask Mark for any comments, um, both from a, a teaching perspective, but also somebody that does or is in charge of taking athletes um, to play in WBSC events about the, the importance of being able to, you know, fulfill all the requirements of this delivery. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things, um, and more so looking at the men's side, is the ability to stay in the shoot. Um, I know that um, with our U23 men's program, you know, we definitely place an emphasis with our pitching staff, the importance of being able to, you know, being able to deliver the ball legally, um, you know, as has been indicated by, you know, the, the slow motion, you know, pictures that have been indicated here that Scott's got in place. Um, and that's what we've been working with on our pitchers to make sure that that takes place. And I think that also, if you're able to stay within the shoot, I think part of that is also uh, assist you with your mechanics. I think mechanically, if you are um, able to um, set up and deliver the ball legally, I think mechanically you're going to be throwing the ball more efficiently than, you know, if you are um, jumping completely to the left or to the right based on whether you're a right-handed or left-handed pitcher. So I think it's an advantage for pitchers to, you know, stay, you know, within the shoot. Um, to help with their velocity, to help with their movement, help with their location. Um, are there advantages from time to time being able to jump, you know, more left, more right to try and throw the ball across the plate, you know, hit different angles, maybe with a different pitch, you know, certainly it's another variation, but I think consistently, if you're able to, um, you know, stay within the shoot, I think that's, it's more of an advantage for you to do it than not to. Um, and that's kind of what we've been looking at with a number of our, uh, U23 men's uh, throwers and certainly looking at the guys that have been pitching with our, with our men's team as well. Excellent. And I, oh, I just wanted to add a few points from the umpiring perspective of trying to, you know, officiate or adjudicate this, you know, the, the action when they, when they come forward and just letting any pitcher out there or coach know that, you know, when your first base or your coach or your pitcher starts as a right-handed thrower on the far first base side and then moves to the umpire's right, that's easy for us to see because we know you have to be out because you're moving away from us and we can see that. So, you know, if you have somebody that has a delivery that's prone to drifting, you know, to their glove side, you know, move them to the side of the rubber that's going to allow, or they're far enough in the middle or the other side of the rubber that's going to allow them to land comfortably within the chute. You know, don't start them right on a borderline where it's, you know, it's not necessarily guaranteed that they're going to be able to come forward. Um, and then the other thing too is, you know, if, if pitchers, you know, when an umpire comes out and, and asks, you know, talks to your pitcher about the shoot violation, um, moving to the, say, the far third base side, at, you know, um, and attempting to pitch there, even if, you know, you may be now 
a small fraction out of the shoot. If you're starting off on the, th the full third base side, it's going to be, you know, most umpires are going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you're inside the shoot at that point. Um, it's just a reality, um, it, you know, because it, it's harder to tell at that point. So I'm not saying that we're not going to call things if you start on the, the full third base side and manage to leap all the way to the first base side. But it is something that, you know, you can work with. And if you work with your umpires and move over to that side, um, you're going to have less challenges uh, as far as going forward um, with umpires calling shoot violations for you. I think the other part too, Scott, is that it's the, it's your, you know, it's that lead foot that needs to be within the shoot. Yep. Like if your back foot happens to end up outside of it, that's, that's not where the infraction is. Nope. You know, we're just looking to have that front foot in. So I think sometimes, you know, the expectation of trying to keep both feet in, they're like, well, how do I do that when I'm, you know, leaping, you know, it's, I think the important piece to identify that it is, the, is the front foot, your landing foot. So when you do leap and land, we we're, you're just looking for that landing foot to be in the chute. And then, you know, the back foot could, can be out. Right. So I think that's an important point to note as well is that it's not both feet. It's, it's the front landing foot. Absolutely. It's the front foot. We don't care about the back foot at all. So just make sure that front foot lands there. So um, now moving forward, I think Mark addressed a little bit as er, at earlier, but I do just want to, you know, clarify that, that, you know, Mark and I had chatted a little earlier and I just wanted to repeat is biomechanically, you know, being able to push forward and get all your levers and, and drive moving forward through the mound is, is, is an advantage. Um, and, you know, and it's something that should, what I gather as an umpire learning about pitching motions is, you know, the the air and the leap should come from the push from the rubber moving forward rather than trying to jump straight up land and then throw the pitch yeah i mean for me it's you, you pitching starts with your legs you, you need to be efficient using good explosive movements with both of your legs driving towards your catcher you know you want to go long towards your catcher you know when you're throwing the ball um, and the most, you know, and I go back to whether it's the men's program or the women's program, the, our best pitchers um, with our national team internationally, they use their legs. They're very efficient um, using their legs. They've got good sequence um, through the complete pitching motion, and that's why they're successful. Um, so I think being able to encourage um, our younger pitchers to start using their legs at an early age um, as I said, for me, it's the use of the legs and the power that that's going to help generate um, and help initiate delivery of each pitch, um, as opposed to focusing on will they jump or not jump. That's not where my emphasis will be, is that I want to make sure that my pitchers are you know, pitching as efficiently as they can. And part of that efficiency for myself is making sure you use your legs effectively. Excellent. All right, I'm going to stop the share of the screen here. And at this point, we're able to take, if you have any questions for Mark or myself, um, we're happy to take any questions that you have. You can uh, raise a hand. You can just turn your mic on and ask. Um, we can go from there. There are many little faces here. I hope maybe just raise your hands or so. Going once. Now let's see, just double check the chat here if I can see it. We've got coaching numbers. Da, 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 no question. And just for the one person did ask, there is no sound in the video. Um, just so you know, we couldn't get the rights to anything awesome from the Beatles or anything like that. We don't quite have the budget for that. Um, so we just went with no sound because it, it, really the envision of the video is that it's a teaching tool that you can walk through it and reference it. So you know you don't need to hear the same. 1970s, you know, kind of soul track playing underneath it every single time. So we're just going to let it go back and forth and you can use it and, 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 and go as you need to. All right. So any questions? Oh, how do, where are the recordings? They'll be on the Softball Canada Umpires YouTube channel. Um, and the, the also the video itself will be as a separate entity there. And then I will talk nicely to Jill's um, and get these the pitching video itself posted to the um, to the Softball Canada YouTube main page as well. So um, we do have one question. Uh, the chances of using shoot lines at Softball Canada, the chances are fairly high, Bruce. Um, it is something we're looking at um, and looking to use as a reference. For those that are 
not familiar with that concept, I think a quick Google of any NCAA softball um, experience right now will show you those lines, and the, it's really just a guideline on the on the field. So we, you know, pitchers and umpires are like know exactly where everybody stands because the uh, the lines are there for you to see. Uh, question from for Mark from Phil Ransom that says, "Will can pitch make any changes to their progression now that leaping is allowed?" Um, it'll be something that we'd have to discuss with our camp pitch committee, but certainly the initial camp pitch is looking at, you know, primarily U9, you know, U11, maybe U13 pitchers. So for those pitchers, you know, introducing one foot for sure. Um, but I think for the younger athletes until they're ready to do a whole lot of leaping, um, I don't know if they're quite ready. Some may be more advanced than others, which is a possibility. Um, but I don't think, um, you know, for that younger age level, I think the mechanics of, you know, there's definitely going to be some changes with the can pitch, which will be released um, relatively soon. I know the videos and those things have been um, getting finalized uh, the last uh, couple of weeks. So there are changes coming in it with feet positioning and ball positioning and hand positioning for certain things. But as far as introducing leaping, um, I don't see us introducing that right away, but certainly would be something that would have to be discussed as far as, you know, what extent we would look at um, to match the, the rule, you know, with introductory pitching. All right. So I do see a couple of comments from Mitch regarding, uh, you know, sharing this with some of our international players. And I can just say that, you know, talking to Mark as well as some of the other coaches on the national team staff, they're all very well aware of um, the necessity for a pitcher to be able to pitch within these guidelines in order to um, effectively represent our country. Country. All right. Any other questions as we go? Um, like I said, the videos will be on our YouTube page. You know, follow, subscribe, etc. You get notifications once they're up. And other than that, if there's no more questions, uh, I'll just remind you that next Monday, March 14th, 7 p.m., we'll be doing the introduction to the new rulebook format um, and explaining what the changes was and why, we're, why we did it and how you as coaches and umpires will actually enjoy it more than the current rulebook. And then our final webinar series will be March 21st at 7 p.m., and it is on the use of the DP flex rule for anybody that wants to follow along. So other than that, if that is it, no more questions, Mark and I will thank you and say, see you later. All right. And everybody slowly disappears. That they do. There we go.